hear and receive what God's word is. One more time. God is good. And all the, all the time. All right. So my name is Brandon Pine. Uh, I don't know if you guys have the picture or picture of my giant family or not that I sent in earlier, but probably not. Okay. So just me and my wife. It's not a giant family. My wife came with me and my friends, Caitlin and Eli, we're glad to be here. The title of today's message is uh, your perspective matters. And I don't know if you guys have ever had to be the person in the middle of a conflict, right? You're the mediator of a conflict. Anybody ever had to do that before in their life? Like friends having issues and drama and you're like the middleman and you got to go to one side. You got to go talk to somebody and get their side of the story. And you're like, mm-hmm, yeah. No, not Teresa. I don't know. She did that. She said that. So then you, what you got to do? You got to go talk to, to Teresa, right? Like, Teresa, I heard what you said to Nancy. Why? Like, I heard you were kind of being a jerk. And she's like, oh, no, well, she did this to me first, right? Whatever the issue is, you, you go, you talk to both sides of the story, and you get two completely different stories, right? Because the perspective of the people in the stories can completely change what happened. So we're going to look at, we're going to look at a scripture story today from the perspective of everybody involved and really see what happened, what's happening. Hopefully get a new perspective for some of you today. And even though you may have heard the same story multiple times and see what we can get out of it and take away with us as we walk out of here this afternoon. We're going to open up to Mark chapter two and just a little, uh, another brief introduction before we get, you receive the word this morning from me. I just want you guys to be able to feel like, you know, a little bit about the person that's just showing up out of nowhere to to preach in your church. So I like people to to feel like they know me a little bit. So like I said, my name is Brandon. I'm the youth pastor and the young adults pastor from Calvary Church in Dover, Delaware. You guys had Pastor Kuhn recently. So that same church, he was my pastor growing up. So glad to be here as well. I love Jesus, anything Jesus. I love being, I love doing ministry that I'm blessed that that's what I get to do full time. But outside of doing ministry, my what I, my biggest passion is I love sports. I, I love to play sports. I love to watch sports. Like ESPN is on in my, on my phone in my house all the time. Football, basketball, soccer. Like I, soccer is my favorite. I love to play it. I love to watch it. I play for my church softball team. I'm terrible at that sport, but I play it anyway. Like it's bad. It's like slow pitch softball, and I still swing and like whiff. Like I'm not very good at it, but I'm I'm decent at other sports. So. If you love sports, I'll talk to you about that anytime. That's, that's what I'm pretty passionate about. Well, let's go ahead and dive into the scripture this morning. Mark 2, starting at verse 1. A few days later, when Jesus again entered Capernaum, the people heard that he had come home. Now, I know you might be thinking, home. Well, I read, I read the uh, Christmas story, and... Jesus' home, he was born in Bethlehem. So why is it saying he would come home? And, well, he was born in Bethlehem. You're correct. And he left. He fled Bethlehem when King Herod tried to kill him because he was jealous of the king of the Jews being born. And so they fled to Egypt, and eventually he was raised in Nazareth. So that was his hometown growing up. And we know Nazareth later rejects Jesus as the Messiah. So his home base in the sense of ministry, the majority of the gospels, when you read what's happening in Jesus' ministry, the majority of it happens in Capernaum in the Galilee region. So they're not saying like Jesus is from here, but what we know about the majority of Jesus' life from 30 to 33, most of that takes place in Capernaum. And then the end of it, he works his way down and into Jerusalem eventually. So that's why it says home, but it's not where he was from and born and raised, but that was his home base, you can say, for ministry. Let's continue in verse 2. They gathered in such large numbers that there was no room left, not even outside the door. And he preached the word to them. So some men came bringing to him a paralyzed man carried by four of them. Since they could not get since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus by digging through it and then lowered the man, lowered the mat the man was lying on. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, son, your sins are forgiven. 
Now some teachers of the law were sitting there, thinking to themselves, why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Immediately, Jesus knew in his spirit that this is what they were thinking in their hearts. And he said to them, why are you thinking these things? Which is easier, to say to a paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up, take your mat, and walk? But I want you to know that the Son of Man has the authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the man, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. He got up, took his mat, and walked out in full view of them all. This amazed everyone, and they praised God, saying, we have never seen anything like this. Amen. So we're going to see this story from the viewpoint of Jesus, the Pharisees, the crowd, and the man on the mat, and his friends. So the first, we're going to start, of course, we have to look at Jesus' point of view. Jesus, there's three points from Jesus in this story. He prioritized the soul over the, over the physical. He prioritized the soul over the physical. So when they lower the man down in front of Jesus, in front of this crowd, the first thing he does is say, son, your sins are forgiven. So the friends brought him there because that was where Jesus did most of the miracles. They knew, a crowd gathered, they knew what Jesus did for people. They'd seen the lepers be healed. They'd seen people people's lives changed by bringing them to Jesus. So they bring their friend and they lower him before Jesus to be healed. Jesus goes to him, does something better than a physical healing, says, son, your sins are forgiven, and then turns and addresses the Pharisees. Imagine being the man on the mat and thinking, like, okay, I'm in front of Jesus. This is my turn. This is my turn, my life to be changed. Son, your sins are forgiven, Jesus says to you, which that changes eternity. But he came there for a healing. And then Jesus turns and starts talking to other people. He's probably like, wait, wait, that's only part of it. Like, I came here for, a little, for, for something else. But he got more than what he came there for. Like, a physical healing would have been great, but he had eternity changed in that moment when Jesus forgave his sins. But praise God for point two as well. He still cared for the physical. So he addressed the Pharisees and what they were saying, what they were thinking. But then he still turned back and he said, get up, take your mat and go home. And the third point about Jesus was he was bold with the truth. The Pharisees were thinking, how can he say that? How can he forgive sins? And Jesus said, your, your sins are forgiven and then he said, the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. Proclaiming the truth there, no matter what people think, no matter what persecution might come from Rome or from the Pharisees in that moment, bold with the truth of the gospel who he was, saying, I have the authority on earth to forgive. What a bold statement he had in that moment. The second viewpoint of the Pharisees in this story. They had a, such extreme focus on knowledge and tradition. It caused them to miss the working and the presence of God right in front of them. In our lives, I think it's important that we're not so focused on things, routine and things like that, that we miss the working and the presence of God in our lives on a day today basis. I mean, if we think about just taking time to sit in God's presence rather than rush to the next thing and fill our schedule with the very next thing. I mean, taking the time to just watch a beautiful sunset. And although we don't worship the beauty of creation, we worship the creator knowing that he created such a thing. Seeing the, thing, seeing the blessings that are in our everyday life rather than, rather than trying to pursue the next version of the newest electronic item or whatever, the, the, the next model car or whatever it is, thinking that's what's going to fulfill us when it's the presence of God that's going to fulfill us. Seeing the working and the moving of Jesus 
and his blessings in our life on a day-to-day -day basis and trying to figure out how he wants to use us on a day-to-day -day basis rather than just the rush of the next thing. The Pharisees missed it. They were such, they were so staunch on what was tradition, what's supposed to be, how are things supposed to be that they missed Jesus right in front of them. We don't want to miss God moving in our everyday life because we're worried about how things are supposed to look or how things are supposed to be. Things are supposed to be good enough. Now God, God loves us and he, he wants us to be with him regardless. We don't have to be perfect before we come to Jesus. The next was, is the paralyzed man and his friends. What I love about the statement in the scripture, Jesus saw their faith. It doesn't say he just saw the man's faith that was on the mat. He saw their faith. Our faith can play a part in the lives of others. It's a great and a powerful, true statement. I want us to look at another scripture story that just further emphasizes this point. Matthew 8, verses 5 through 13 show this in a powerful way that our faith can play a part in the lives of others. When Jesus had entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him asking for help. Lord, he said, my servant lies at home paralyzed, suffering terribly. Jesus said to him, shall I come and heal him? The centurion replied, Lord, I do, not, sir, I do not deserve to have you come under my roof, but just say the word and my servant will be healed. For I myself am a man under authority with soldiers under me. With under me. I tell this one, go, and he goes, and that one come, and he comes. I say to the servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed and said to those following him, truly I tell you, I have, found, I have not found anyone in Israel with such great faith. I say to you that many will come from the east and the west and will take their places at the feast with Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and the kingdom of heaven. But the subjects of the kingdom will be thrown outside into the darkness and there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then Jesus said to the centurion, go. Let it be done just as you believed it would. And his servant was healed at that moment. The servant at home, paralyzed, didn't, wasn't there. He wasn't face to face, face with Jesus. He wasn't at Jesus' feet. He, he didn't get to be lowered down in front of the crowd. But the centurion, in his great faith, sought out Jesus so that his servant would be healed. His faith, the centurion's faith, greatly affected the life of the servant. Our faith can greatly affect and play a role and have an impact on others. Amen. The second point, how far are you willing to carry someone's mat if you're the friend? There's times where our friends are going to be down, out, lost, whether that's physical, physically hurt, emotionally hurt, depressed, lost in life, not sure where they're going. And that's what God has given us community for. There's a reason why God has God established the church, why we're supposed to gather on Sunday mornings and Wednesday evenings and, and be together in community because he puts people around us that it, we're supposed to carry someone's mat. And it's how far are you willing to carry someone's mat? So they, they picked the man up, carried his mat. Man, but I want friends like these four friends. Like surround yourself with friends that are like the friends in the story. Not just, not just surface level friends or even intermediate, like deep level friends. Really deep level friends. Because they were willing to do something for him, carry him to Jesus. But there's plenty of friends that would have stopped at the crowd and been like, oh, maybe, not. like Jesus is here all the time. It says this is his home. I'm, they could have turned to him and be like, we'll try tomorrow. Or next time Jesus is in town, we'll try then. Like the, the, the house is packed. There's nothing we can do. We can't get through the crowd. Sorry, like we'll come back another time. So, some friends will, will do things for you but I want friends that are, that are going to cut a roof in someone's 
the, a hole in someone's roof for me. Like if I need to get to Jesus, if your friend needs to get to Jesus, you need to be the type of friend that's willing to fight through the crowd, that's willing to climb a roof, that's willing to cut a hole in somebody's roof and lay them in front of the feet of Jesus. That's the type of people that I want in my life. And who do you have, is the third point, who do you have carrying your mat? We have the challenge of we're meant to be great friends carrying somebody else's mat, but you need to know at some, none of us are perfect, right? None of us are perfect. At some point in your life, you're going to be the friend on the mat. You're going to be down and out. Whether it's a loss of a loved one, whether it's a loss of a job, whether it's anything, and you need friends that are going to take you to Jesus. Surround yourself with friends that no matter what happens in life, they take you to Jesus. And you be the type of friend that no matter what happens in your friend's life, you take them to Jesus. Nowhere else. We don't need to take anybody anywhere else but to Jesus. And how do we do that specifically? How do you take somebody to Jesus? You take them through the word. You give them the truth. You're bold with the truth. You give them the word of God because Jesus is what? He's the word became flesh, correct? So when people are down and they're hurting, how do you take them to Jesus? Because he's not physically walking this earth anymore. Well, we lay hands and we pray for one another because scripture says that confession and prayer for one another is where we find healing. But we give them the word of God. We give them scripture. We give them the Bible because he is the word that became flesh. That's how you pick somebody's mat up and you carry them to Jesus. And it might get difficult. It's going to get heavy. Good thing, good thing there was four of them. And don't stop at like, oh, one setback from my friend. Like, I tried. I'm done. They had, they, had a, they had a setback. They hit the crowd, and they could have been done. But they continued. They, they did what is, what, everything they could to get their friend in front of Jesus for his healing. Let's look at the next one, the crowd. The crowd. They were so focused on what they could see, what they could hear, they missed the person around them who needed Jesus the most. I want to preface this. Don't get me wrong. This is the kind of like church statement and whatnot that gets you uninvited or doesn't get me invited back. All the things we do for the Lord are for his glory, and they're good. The way we gather on Sunday morning, we gather on Wednesday night for prayer, which prayer is where it all starts. Like, be here on Wednesday. If you have time, be here on Wednesday evening for your church prayer night because God moves in prayer. We gather on maybe Friday night home group Bible studies and things like that. The regular church-going routine and whatnot. But that's exactly, the crowd was so in it, on focused on eyes on Jesus and what he was doing, that they missed the person right behind them who also needed Jesus and needed Jesus the most. If we, are, if we get so into church routine and so into our doing things for our, ourself and our own faith, then we're partially missing it. That's only part of it. If we're actually listening, if we're actually reading our scripture on, an, on a regular basis and hearing what is being said at church on a regular basis and going, being in the presence of Jesus the most, if the, those people at the front of the crowd probably were actually listening to Jesus, they would have known that they needed to bring the guy outside the house in because Jesus was, what did he preach about all the time? He was there for the sick and the needy. He came to seek and save the lost. He told his disciples to go. If all we do is the church things, but we never actually see the hurting people outside the walls of the church or that are in our day-to-day -day lives at work or at school or anything, we don't, see, we don't go give them hope, then we have crowd syndrome. I want you to think about your life in the last week or the last month and you think about your church attendance or, or, or the church things you do and the, the personal devotions, which are amazing, and all those things are, are good things. But if we have more check boxes of church things we did than gospel conversations with, peop with lost people, 
then we might be getting crowd syndrome. If we're more excited about the next Hillsong or Maverick City worship album than the lost souls of our coworkers, then we might have crowd syndrome. If we know more about the original Greek and the theology and the, and the Hebrew word of the Bible, then we actually are speaking to lost souls, then we might have crowd syndrome. If we talk more about the power of the Holy Spirit in our life, then we actually depend on the power of the Holy Spirit in our life. We might have crowd syndrome. There's a, there's a slight difference there. We can know all about it. We can, des we can desire the power of the Holy Spirit. We can talk about the power of the Holy Spirit. But are we living a life that actually requires the Holy Spirit, that, that we depend on the Holy Spirit? Because the Holy Spirit is there for us to be his witnesses. It's vital for us to look at our life and think, man, I'm doing the things I'm supposed to be doing, but I'm missing half of it. It's okay if, if you realize, man, I might have been more like the crowd recently than the disciples that Jesus sent out. Let's look at how do we know. This is how we know what the power of the Holy Spirit is for and how, and how, we, how we get rid of the crowd syndrome in our life. Acts 1 if you go to the next scripture, Acts 1, verses 4 through 8 says this. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Then they, gave, then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know the time or the dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witness, witnesses to Jerusalem, to all Judea, and to the ends of the earth. We're supposed to go and ga like, be gathered. He says, wait in Jerusalem. Receive the power of the Holy Spirit. We're supposed to go. We're supposed to, to, to pray. Like the prayer meeting on Wednesday night, we're supposed to be in prayer and seeking his will and seeking his power. But after that, we're supposed to go and be his witnesses to Jerusalem and to Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. We're supposed to be his witnesses to the ends of the earth. Like I love how you guys have the flags laid up here and the, the flags in the back, especially that one that's on the corner. Some of you guys can't see it. It's the Belizean flag. That's where my family's from. from. So when I walked in, I was blessed when I saw that because it's a small, not known much about country and like you don't see that flag everywhere very often. We're, you're supposed to be our witnesses to everywhere, to all these nations, but also to the neighborhood that's right back here and to Wilmington, Delaware, and throughout the state and the surrounding area. It's when you have the power of the Holy Spirit through that personal time, through that church attendance, through the, the prayer meetings, through your personal devotions, it's in that time God fills you and prepares you to go. But don't just have that time, and then we don't go. That's the crowd. And we're meant to be disciples, not just the crowd. Acts 2, verses 42 through 47 says this, They devoted themselves to the apostles' teachings, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. That's the, that's the gathering. Right? That's what we're supposed to do here, Wednesdays, house meetings. Everyone was filled with awe. The many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers who were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who was in need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their numbers daily those who were being saved. So they did the gatherings but they also went out and did the work of the gospel. They did the work that Jesus had taught them to do for three years. And they spoke with boldness, and the Lord added to their numbers daily. Imagine if they had just received the Holy Spirit that moment in Acts 2, and then Peter didn't get up and speak that message and had the thousands added to them on the very first day of Pentecost from nothing to mega church right away, right? What if Peter didn't get up and operate in the power of the Holy Spirit? 
if we seek the Holy Spirit in prayer, but we don't go out and actually operate in it, what's it for? What's he for? Then at then that point in our life, what are we doing? Because I know we all have hurt people around us in our neighborhoods, in our schools, in our workplaces that, have, that don't have the hope of Jesus Christ. And that's why he's put you there. That's why he's put this church here in Wilmington, Delaware, to be the hope, to go out and share his word and his gospel, to be his witnesses throughout. And one last point, it's, I don't have a slide for it, to focus as we go out, to focus on the mat, the man that was on the mat. Jesus did turn away and he, he addressed the Pharisees. He turned back and he said, pick up your mat and go home. And that last sentence was, he walked out in full view of everyone. My challenge to you, New City Church, is to go out, to walk out, to live out your faith unashamed of the gospel in full view of everybody. Walk out and live out your faith in full view of everybody. Revelations 12, 11 says, they, the, pe the people, overcome by the blood of the lamb and the word of your testimony. Our testimony doesn't save people. Right? Our, our words, we don't do anything to save, us, to save other people. It's all the blood of Jesus Christ, his death and his resurrection that saves people. But I, I praise God. He, God is so good that he gives us a role to play. Think about how crazy that is. God gives us a role to play in his kingdom and in, in the work that needs to be done. We could be saved and immediately beamed up to heaven, but that wasn't Jesus' purpose or his plan for us to be saved and then just huddle up in, in, in basements or in churches and not go out and invite people overcome by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony because our testimony points to the blood of the lamb and that's how people come to know Jesus. He's given you your story, your testimony, your life is the witness. Go out in full view, unashamed of what Jesus has done for you, through you, so that people can see it. You'll be shining light. Take the, take the, Bucket, take whatever off the shining light that's in your heart. With boldness, open your mouth. With boldness, declare the truth. With boldness, share what Jesus has done for you and through you in your life. And when, when your testimony shares Jesus, 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 people come. Some might, some might not be for it. Some might reject it. It's true. The, the, the demon-possessed man that was that Jesus went to go get on the other side of the Sea of Galilee. He crosses the Sea of Galilee to talk to one man, a demon-possessed man. And I love this story because just as they rejected Jesus in Nazareth as the Messiah, the people in that town that the demon-possessed man was from reject, rejected Jesus and rejected the gospel. But it also says that he went out untrained. He went out and he shared in Decapolis, which was the, a region on the east side of the Sea of Galilee, throughout Decapolis, which is a region of 10 cities. He went throughout Decapolis and shared what Jesus has done for them. And it says they were amazed. And the cities in Decapolis, the 10 cities, received Jesus. That man was the first, the first evangelist that Jesus commissioned to go. He hadn't even commissioned the, uh, the disciples to go yet. Untrained, no theology degree, nothing. He said, go share what I've done for you. Go share what the Lord has done for you. He went throughout the capitalists and the people were amazed. All he shared was his story. All he shared was his, te was his testimony. You share what Jesus has done for you in your life. Some people will say, oh, that's for you. And other people will be amazed and they'll say, I need that as well. And then you continue to share. And they come to know Jesus and you bring them here. And, they, and, they're, and they're discipled. Amen. Let me pray. God, thank you for your truth. Thank you for your word. Lord, I pray that this church, the members of this church, everybody here today, Lord, that, that we would walk out of here with a deeper understanding of what you've done in our lives. And that we would walk out of here in full view of everybody unashamed of your gospel unashamed of who you are and ready to share 
with whoever you put in our way, Lord. We, we understand your scripture that says you've created good works for us to walk in in advance. You are creating divine appointments for us. You're setting up divine appointments for us right now in the future this week that we're not even aware of. But I pray when we get in those moments, we'll be so familiar with your word and so familiar with the leading of your Holy Spirit that we're able to operate in the gifts you've given us. We're able to be unashamed and share the truth in those appointments. Lord, I pray that, that you would set people up at the grocery store and at the restaurant and at home and in their neighborhoods and in their workplaces. Lord, would you prepare the hearts for the people that this church is going to go and encounter and that they would speak your truth powered by the Holy Spirit and boldness. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, New City Church.